welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Deulika Gottlieb. I'm delighted to open the fourth webinar in the European Health Union Initiative series that the European Health Forum Gastein has been co-organizing with the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies in the course of this year. Today's webinar will follow up from the Gastein discussions where we called for a moonshot for a true European health union. And it is also linked to the joint EuroHealth publication on the same topic. The development of the European Health Union since its launch by Ursula von der Leyen in September 2020 has been exciting and has, of course, been watched very closely by the European health community. And another milestone just happened yesterday with the launch of the EU Global Health Strategy. Today, we will look specifically at how the European Health Union supports member states in strengthening their health system resilience. And we'll hear the perspectives from different stakeholders on where we stand and how they work together. And we're delighted to have the Austrian Minister of Social Affairs, Health Care and Consumer Protection, Johannes Rauch with us today who was also involved in the discussions in Gastein earlier this year. And actually the Austrian ministry organized a session on funding mechanisms and other innovative solutions contributing to a more sustainable and efficient and thereby also more resilient health system. Uh, just a quick note to our participants, if you could please use the chat function to, and I will then later on bring in your questions and comments. And that just leaves me to hand over to the trusted hands of today's moderator, Matthias Wisma from the European Observatory. I look forward to the discussions today and I very much hope you will enjoy today's event. Thank you and over to you, Matthias. Dolly, thank you so much and good afternoon and welcome to everyone. And I think this is a really important uh, moment and uh, we are quite excited because haven't we seen an amazing response from the in European institutions with regards to COVID-19? We've seen the mobilization of budget existing organizations, the creation of new organizations. We have seen the introduction of new policies. And as you say, Dolly, just yesterday, a new strategy and all this under the umbrella of a European Health Union, and much of it, quite some of it actually, to strengthen the resilience of European health system. So I think it's a very good moment, more than two years after the speech of Ursula von der Leyen on European Health Union, to take stock where are we actually with European Health Union, with strengthening the resilience of European health systems. So. I'll lead you, I'll guide you today through the uh, webinar and we've structured it in, in two blocks. The first block is a bit of a conversation between the Austrian minister and uh, Maya Matthews, the director from DG Santé. And after this conversation, we will have panel discussion with stakeholders, experts, other polit politicians, and you will also have the opportunity to use the chat. Please be reminded, we are recording this session and um, after the session, um, you will receive an evaluation and you would do us a great favor if you could fill it in. It helps us to understand, you know, what are your expectations and how we can improve in the future. Now, um, let me introduce uh, the excellent speakers we have today. We have Johannes Rauch, Austrian Minister for Social Affairs, Health, Long-Term Care and Consumer Protection. And that's quite a portfolio. It's a mega ministry, actually. Johannes Rauch is responsible for so many different aspects and also a huge, huge um, budget. And we have asked him to join this webinar because we know that Austria has been particularly skillful and engaged in using European tools and instruments to strengthen the resilience of the health systems and to advance health policy reforms. The other speaker we have today, and I'm so grateful that she is joining, is Maya Matthews. She's acting director, DG Santé for Digital, EU for Health and Health Systems Modernization. And these are all the elements actually which we want to talk about today. EU for Health, the public health program of the European Union, you know, it has, green, has, has, it has grown substantially, I think more than 11 times the volume of the, but of the previous budget. Health system modernization is exactly what, what we are talking about when it comes to health systems resilience. And digital is of course, 
a very, very important aspect of it. So that's for the introduction. And now, um, Minister Rauch, <laughs> please forgive me if it is a little bit blunt, but maybe I can ask you really directly, what has the EU actually done for the Austrian health system for Austrian reforms? How have they supported you? Please, Minister, the floor is all yours. At first, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, the question also could be, don't ask what the European Union uh, can do for Austria. Ask what Austria can do for the European Union to stay unified. Uh, but the European Union has done a lot uh, uh, to support the Austrian reform efforts. Austria implemented structural governance reforms between 2013 and 17. These laid the groundwork for organizational and structural changes within the health system. Austria leveraged three types of European Union support to advance the implementation of these reforms. First, technical support from the Structural Reform Support Service. The SRSS has supported Austrian policymakers with tailored startup services to encourage health professionals, especially young doctors, to establish their own primary healthcare units. The report provided since 2018 has included hands-on consultancy services to develop business plans, a startup guide. Uh, uh, this emanation strategy to attract professionals, training sessions for regional administrators. Second, loans and financial advisory services from the European Investment Bank, very important. Uh, secondly, secondly, the Austrian government pooled financial support from the European Investment Bank and other partner banks in Austria. Uh, third point, funding for primary health care from financial instruments, including the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Austria has recently pledged 100 million towards its primary health care reform and its national recovery plan. The allocated funds from the recovery and resilience facility will continue to support the establishment of new infrastructure. Additionally, we are focusing on promoting the digitalization and improving the environmental sustainability of existing facility. So the answer in short is a lot, a very lot. Thank you so much. And it's quite uh, quite impressive. I understand that Austria already started to use tools well before the crisis and well before the crisis responses. But you also have used tools which are just available since COVID-19 responses. And some of the tools are more technical in nature, but others are also financial and support really the development and uh, um, investment in, in infrastructure. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Rauch. Maya. I would like to come to you and my question is, I mean, you've always been working very closely with member states and what we heard from uh, uh, Minister Rauch is that some of them are really very concrete tools, you know, which can be seen, you know, at the grassroots level actually in, in the implementation. But now that you have such a big, big, big budget and so many additional tools, you know, how has your work actually changed with member states? Has it intensified? Thank you very much, Matthias, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, actually, yes, I, I really love your question because I like the way that you said it's not like it's all starting from scratch. We've had a long uh, relationship with member states, but definitely the COVID pandemic kind of accelerated the intensity um, because of the need that all of a sudden health was in the spotlight. And we realize, and all of the people I'm sure listening are, are from the health community, we always knew how central health was to society and to economics. But I think now the whole world knows that. And I want to give two examples of how our um, relations with the member states in health has indeed um, intensified. And one of them is on the recovery and resilience facility 
facility that the minister mentioned. I think, uh, I don't know if everyone is aware, but this is one of the biggest um, uh, funding instruments. Uh, it was created as a direct consequence of the pandemic with about 700 billion euros available to member states to basically build back from the pandemic with a focus on uh, digital transformation and green transition. But health is a key component in that. And what we've seen now is that every member state has produced a plan, like the minister said, for Austria, the plan is very much focused on um, primary health care, the continuation of the reforms that they've done and digital. But what I can say now is that every plan has been adopted now, 27 plans have been adopted with the last one, Hungary, just being adopted uh, yesterday by the Commission. And each of these plans has a health component. And at the beginning, we didn't know because this is a bottom up, it's up to member states to decide where they want to put their money. So I think that already already shows you a little bit of the thinking that uh, for all member states, health uh, is absolutely an important part of the future development and um, uh, the response uh, to the pandemic. In general, there's about 40 billion euros um, being invested in health through this recovery and resilience facility, which dwarfs any other um, EU instrument, which is why I, I wanted to make the case and mention it. And um, again, it, it's very varied, which it should be because it's tailor made to the specific context of each member state where they see the need to, um, to, to address their reforms and investments in health. Um, as you said, our, our relations with member states have intensified and um, until recently we didn't really have a fora to discuss with member states health systems. And so under the Slovenian presidency in council conclusions, uh, we uh, used an existing expert group called the Health Systems Performance Ass Assessment Expert Group and kind of revamped it to create a, um, a group where we could uh, discuss uh, innovations in health uh, together and to kind of share all of these changes that have happened in, in, a, in an environment where it's uh, open to, to sharing best practice, but also where we can bring quite technical knowledge about the performance of health systems. So to, find, uh, to, to finish, I think what would be very important in our uh, new um, and more intensified relations is from the Commission side to facilitate and support member states in using um, and maximizing the opportunities available for EU funds. And as the Minister from Austria said, Austria is already a kind of front runner in showing how to do this. Thank you. Maya, thank you so much, but that's really great news because um, at the time Austria was uh, kind of ahead of the of, of many others. One was a pioneer actually in using um, uh, systematically EU tools and, and funds. And now hearing from you that so many member states are actually including health in their recovery and resilience plans, that's actually very good. And it also points a little bit into the future that we are probably seeing activities over the next couple of years and that you will continue to work with them very, very closely. Thank you so much, Maya, for this. Um, the, Minister Rauch, this, this session today, the webinar, we were talking about uh, the European Health Union, and uh, we all know that uh, two years ago we had this landmark speech from Commissioner, uh, from the President of the Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen. What does it mean to you, European Health Union? It's something new, actually, for member states as well, because in the past we would never talk about a European Health Union. It just came on the table, you know, with COVID-19 responses. What does it mean to you, European Health Union? I'm uh, in favor of the further development of a strong and sustainable social and health union uh, because well developed and uh, accessible social protection and health systems in Europe are essential to address current and future challenges. The common approach of uh, the European Union to the recent challenges of uh, addressing COVID-19 has proven uh, its, its worth. We saw, for example, the speedy production and procurement of vaccines, uh, especially preventing uh, bottlenecks. And the development of the European Green Pass uh, that uh, facilitated travel throughout the continent. The goal must be to continue to make uh, the best possible use of such common structures in the future because we are facing new challenges. We are in the midst uh, of, uh, of a perma crisis. 
in view of this uh, perma crisis, uh, we discussed it in, in, in Gastein, namely the war in the Ukraine, uh, the climate crisis, pandemic, uh, with all its uh, social and health consequences. Actually, uh, the energy markets, uh, um, which rise up the prices for everybody in the households, especially in vulnerable households, uh, with uh, impact on health for anybody uh, in, in the system. The EU and its uh, member states find themselves in uh, particularly challenging times, uh, we know. The effects of uh, events such as the climate uh, crisis and the war in Ukraine, as well as pandemic preparedness, do not stop at our national uh, borders. And it is only by working together uh, that we can achieve results. For example, we need to sustainably strengthen a more independent Europe in order to move away from fossil fuel energy. Uh, sidestep, Austria has a dependence on Russian gas by 80%. It's a horrible, uh, a horrible thing, actually. Uh, and thus also from uh, geopolitical dependencies to be able to guarantee more sustainable security of energy supply at, uh, fair, at fair prices. And finally, we need a strong social Europe in particular where it uh, comes to combating poverty and the right to universal, universal health care, uh, no matter who you are or where you live uh, in Europe. We need uh, a stronger commitment to implementing the European pillar of social rights uh, at all levels well-developed social protection and uh, healthcare systems accessible to all are essential for crisis management and their functioning is a measure of resilience and ensures social peace. Thank you so much, Minister Rauch. I think there was a very strong and very clear statement that the learnings from COVID-19 and the responses to COVID-19 are very, very clear. We need to act together and we need to see that we act throughout Europe. And there's not just the health aspect in it. As you say, we have so many different crises, the Parma crisis, you know, we cannot say what will be the next one. And that there's always a very, very strong social aspect in it, a social gradient. Even in health, we see it uh, that it emerges that we have equity issues when it comes to um, helping the people. So thank you so much for this st statement. Maya, it may look awkward to ask you, what does DG Sante think about European Health Union? Because you created it, you have a website on it, but at the same time, I need to ask you because I mean, you know, Ursula von der Leyen's statement was two years ago, and the situation has evolved dramatically, actually. And you have now all these policies, instruments, budgets in place. You see, you start to see how they actually work, what effects they they bring about. So, how do you see European Health Union now? Thank you, Matthias. Yeah, I mean, let's start with the fact that it was uh, Ursula von der Leyen who, who, who basically, it was a rallying cry uh, to member states, but also a recognition that, um, you know, enough hadn't been done and uh, that we all had to work together, member states and all stakeholders, if we wanted to actually um, benefit the, the, the people, the general public, the patients, because in the end, we're not just doing this for bureaucratic reasons, we're doing this so that uh, people in Europe have a better health, universal health coverage. These are all principles that we've been working on. So I think it was very, it was a very smart move to put this very simple, it's only three words, but it has launched a whole discussion, which obviously people like myself, who, who's been working in this field for over 20 years, it's, it's a, the, the simplicity of it is actually, I think, uh, what's been its success. Because of course, in the beginning, in the aftermath of the pandemic, the focus was on building a new EU health security framework, which we have now done very successfully. But this is only part of the picture. And because the, the, the title of today's webinar is about the resilience of health systems, the resilience of health systems is a very long term um, thing. And, uh, and that's why the European Health Union, I want to make very, it's very clear that the European Health 
Health Union is not only about resilience, it's about long-term sustainability. It's about looking at the general um, health status, bringing in, of course, the social determinants. And so we would see it more as a kind of building a, a, a beautiful structure. And we've, ha we've got many building blocks, many parts to add to it, such as the beating cancer plan, the pharmaceutical strategy. Now we have the European health data space. These are all, I think, incredibly um, creative, innovative, and effective um, policies that together will really provide uh, Europe with a, a wonderful um, model where it shows that where where uh, needed, so where there's added value to use the jargon that we always use. We are working together um, on, on health, um, but at the same time, I think it's also important that we're not trying to make a mega health um, institution. You know, we, we, we have to recognize also, and I'm a very strong believer in this, I, we have to recognize the, the, the contextual nature of health. And so what's beautiful about the European Health Union is that we're putting together pieces of the puzzle where they can be a real difference for better health in Europe. Maya, very clearly, it's it's a holistic perspective, but at the same time, very problem oriented, actually. So it's not adding stuff because for the sake of adding stuff, but it's rather to see where's the problem, what is the crisis, how can we strengthen, how can we can we add value? That's the perspective. And therefore, European Health Union, as I understand it from you, will evolve over time. And that's actually that's actually the, the, the perspective. Thank you so much. Minister Rauch, my last question to you. You were talking about your experiences with um, EU support, EU support tools, uh, and also the new ones now from the from the Recovery and Resilience Fund. Um, how can the how can the EU still still help you? I mean, you said very clearly, don't ask how the EU can help you, how you help the EU. But still, I mean, we 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 all want to see that value is added and that um, citizens, systems, health professionals benefit actually from European Health Union. So what can the EU still do? First, first, let me say, I, I guess the, the pandemic uh, changed our, our mindset all over Europe. Uh, and uh, it is the, the most important uh, change in mindset in, in the last years. Uh, and uh, so, interestingly, most of the support instruments mobilized for the Austrian reform uh, were not inherently geared towards supporting projects in the health area. Consequently, identifying, applying for and combining these tools for health system reform required substantial proactive engagement from Austrian policymakers. It is important to point out that uh, the Austrian success in this area currently uh, represents an exception to the rule. EU member states, health ministries, regional and local authorities generally lack the resources, capacity and expertise uh, for the process of using multiple different EU tools and combining uh, them actively. Exactly this need is addressed by the recently launched technical support instrument resources hub for sustainable investing in health, a joint initiative by, by Austria, Belgium and Slovenia, aiming to pilot uh, a health resources hub supporting the three member states in reaching uh, EU found funding that is uh, available for strengthening public health systems. Such a systematic support process of accessing uh, European Union funding mechanisms could greatly improve the synergies between available instruments and enable member states to better choose those instruments most su suited to their goals. Consequently, contributing to making the case for investing in health systems towards their governments. We need to continue to highlight uh, the positive socio-economic returns of health investments. And let me say, uh, we uh, should use the word investment and not cost 
uh, all the time. I discussed it uh, with my uh, Minister of Finance uh, the last weeks uh, in, a very, in, a very, uh, in a very strong way. In summary, many of the challenges faced by European health systems require changing uh, the status quo. Propelling investment in health systems will require more uh, EU support geared uh, specifically towards the reforms of health systems uh, at the same time, strengthening health policymakers' capacity to advocate for investment and to access the right EU instruments to support their reform processes will be equally crucial steps to strengthen European health systems and to move towards a stronger uh, European health union. Thank you. Minister, oh, thank you so much. And I think there were many very important points in what you just said. I would just uh, like to um, uh, pick out two. One was the last one on the narrative. I think throughout Europe, we need to be very clear. We're talking about investment, you know, investment where we will have returns on because health protects us and protects our economy. That's that's very clear. But the other thing is also very important. And I think it links into your earlier remark. Don't ask what you can do. Ask what you can do for the EU, because I think it's, as I understand from you, it's a two-way process. We also need to be prepared, have the mindset, but also a little bit of uh, the infrastructure to absorb the help which is coming from the European um, Commission, from the European programs, because we all know administrative processes can be sometimes quite complex. There's a lot of programming behind it. It can be difficult to combine different instruments. So we need to have the people also at country level who can help stakeholders, healthcare providers, regional ministries, local administration to make use out of all this stuff. Thank you so much, um, Minister Rauch. And I invite you to stay with us a little bit longer if you wish, but we understand that you have to go quite, quite soon. Maya, it already points into the direction, you know, how do we make this actually sustainable? Because, you know, there are some commentators, they say, oh, these unprecedented levels of budgets, uh, um, it's great, but uh, will the member states um, for the next budget negotiations, will they still be happy or will they go back to earlier budget levels? What will we need to do to um, demonstrate the added value of uh, this additional in investment. How do we do this? Do you already have some ideas, Maya? <laughs> well, I think that if we if we zoom back a little bit, I think that the whole the whole area around um, EU work on health. I think that um, first of all, the member states have to see an added value for them. They have to see, as the minister said, it's it's what they can get out of it, but what also EU can get out of it. So I think that they need to see a benefit in working um, together, and I think that the pandemic has shown that. But there. Are, also, maybe more importantly, is that European citizens, the general public, they also need to understand a little bit more or know um, what, what EU can do and what EU can't do. And I often use two examples. Uh, one is the blood. Um, I think many people don't really realize that the safety and quality of blood and tissues and cells is actually regulated at EU level. So if you have a blood, blood transfusion in Lisbon or in Bucharest, you should be having the same um, quality and safety standards. I think these are important messages where it makes people then realize the benefit of investing at EU level in health. Um, the other very important issue I'd say is better information and data. I mean, we all bang on about it and we saw that with the COVID uh, pandemic, how, how much we needed data and information. I think that's key because it's also part of our communication and the narrative you were talking about. If we don't have good data, if we don't have comparable um, information to be able to share, it's very difficult then to see the benefit perhaps in engaging. And as you said, it can be very time consuming to apply for all of these projects, to go to all these meetings. And here I'm going to do a shameless plug because on Monday, 
we are launching a Health at a Glance uh, 2022 um, uh, publication with the OECD, and it's part of a project with the observatory that we've worked on for many, many years called State of Health um, Cycle. And there, every two years, we produce this publication, which provides you with comparable data. Um, and this is really for policymakers and for the general public. So I would say communication, information, and then, of course, the whole issue about solidarity for people to realize that working together you know we will be able to make uh, uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to make more inroads in 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 many of the health challenges that we are faced with today couldn't agree more and i'm very happy that you say this i was actually yesterday with uh, commissioner nicolas schmidt and he was quoting the country health reports the 2019 versions because they had a focus on the health workforce and we were talking health workforce which is a topic very close to his heart so you see that it also informs the commission insight to to discuss what is what are the 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 issues here maya thank you so much for joining us and uh, Please, uh, I would like to extend uh, the invitation and stay with us for the panel. And I guess there will be some questions coming through the chat and maybe you want to um, respond to them as well. Now, it's time for our panelists round and I'm very happy to um, introduce, to, to present our panelists. First of all, Ricardo Baptiste Leiter. He's a member of the parliament in Portugal. And many of you, many of you will, will know him. I was uh, joking with him in the preparations, asking him, Ricardo, You are you are a seasoned parliamentary. Is it your third term? It said no, Matthias. It's my fourth term in the in the parliament actually. And in between, I was deputy mayor in Kashkesh. So uh, quite quite something. Very interesting to hear this also now from from the perspective of the of the um, national member of parliament. Please, very briefly, two minutes reflection from your side what you just heard, and I would like to um, invite the other panelists as well to join now. Please, well, Ricardo. Thank you so much, Matthias. And uh, thank you to you and to Dorley and to Gastein for also the, the very kind invitation to be here and such a stimulating conversation uh, with his honorable minister and uh, also with Maya Matthews. Uh, and I think that a lot has been said here that is worth uh, worth discussing now uh, as, the, as we move forward. Um, and, you know, I always look at these issues from my multiple hats you mentioned my policy side but right now it's more or less halfway point in my career where i worked half of my life as a practicing physician in the field of infectious diseases and and also in academia and you know it really resonated to me what the minister said uh, when it comes to the importance of concrete tools that are presented in a systematic way in a way that Uh, can be used to push for concrete results. And I think the minister said it all when he said that such tools can be powerful uh, for ministers of health uh, and social affairs in governments to help convince their cabinet members, to convince their prime ministers and presidents that there is a need to invest in health. So there is an actually a very, this is a very powerful tool that the European Health Union, that the commission has to actually accelerate uh, health reform, because one of the major problems that we face in most European countries is that ministers of health do not have enough political leverage and power within cabinet to, to move the agenda forward. And you know what Maya also uh, mentioned around the importance of the, the recovery and resilience plans that are being pushed forward is actually another uh, demonstration of this. And, We, we, we know that these plans have the potential to push for reform as they've done in Austria, but there is a risk that that may not happen. And um, I give you an example from my own country. We, are, we, we envision 300 million euros for digital transition. But if we do not use that wisely, we will just end up keeping the same procedures, just going from analogic to digital, when we actually need to make sure that we're moving in the direction of true reform to achieve the goal that Maya stated out more holistically of what we aim to achieve with the European Health Union, which is sustainability. And sustainability, when it comes to our health systems, demands lowering the burden of disease. There is no other way. We need to make sure that diseases that are preventable are prevented. Diseases that are curable are cured. 
we need to make sure that we are capable of providing the best access to care. We are capable of uh, having the most effective uh, prevention policies out there and making sure that quality of life and well-being are at the core of everything we do. And the truth is we do not have the health systems, as we've said many times. We have disease systems that spend most of our re resources reacting to situations that we could have avoided uh, earlier on. Another issue that I'd like to point out, because I think it addresses what was mentioned by both my and the minister, is um, the opportunity that I think that we can actually use this kind of European tools and funding to maybe accelerate even more domestic funding for health. So uh, we should use these tools to create match and, max, match and mix systems in which for every European do, uh, euro invested, we can include another domestic euro in, in, in health. And potentially this could actually be used for the private sector too to invest, as we know is very important. And the Global Fund has been doing this uh, uh, very, very interestingly. To end, I would say that the minister pointed out also the importance of good examples that we have seen with vaccine procurement with the Green Pass. There is potential moving forward. I think that uh, there are some examples where we have some low-hanging fruit, such as uh, creating um, within a digital, the digital transition, standardizing health indicators so we can measure and compare health outcomes and make sure that we're all moving in the direction of creating health value, creating uh, uh, systems that actually promote well-being of all citizens, but also other areas that the European Union has tried to create more of a European approach, which is rare diseases. It's a no-brainer. We all need a critical mass when it comes to that. And the European reference model uh, for uh, ensuring reference centers can be a very important tool that we can accelerate um, in areas that I believe can generate greater consensus among all citizens. To end, your, your, your universal health coverage was mentioned. I think it is a, a very ambitious goal. COVID, now the war in Ukraine has pulled us back instead of forward uh, in achieving that and the sustainable development goals. We truly need to accelerate the agenda uh, to catch up what we've lost. And I believe that uh, I think both uh, Maya and the minister mentioned the importance of poverty, of understanding the mechanisms of solidarity. And in that sense, to say that we universal health coverage will only be achieved if we involve all vulnerable populations. And so civil society organizations, citizen participation have to be part of this greater vision for Europe. And I'll stop there. Ricardo, thank you so much. That was a very rich um, account of what you what you what you have seen. But I take a couple of points from, from you. Number one is I think you said in different words that. The European Commission, the European Union can actually be a pacemaker in the changing narrative, you know, that we don't fall back into austerity when it becomes difficult financially, but that we really talk about the investment. And also because it has some funny, some, some money, it can support actually the, the start of the investment. Of course, it will not be the exclusive, the only source, but it's one of the sources of seeding money, starting money, whatever, which can start the entire um, process and also we need to talk more about good examples and successful examples so do good things and talk about it thank you we will have another round of uh, questions so ricardo don't don't worry the next panelist i would like to introduce is sarada dash sarada is uh, a long-term brussels uh, person and she is actually the director the, the secretary general of the standing committee of european doctors cpme and with this you are actually representing one of the most important and one of the most powerful professional groups in the in the health systems. And we are all clear, you know, without a strong health workforce, there cannot be any health systems resilience. So, Sarada, what are your reflections from, from the talk of the minister and uh, Maya? Thank you very much, Matthias, and thank you very much for giving us the opportunity today to comment. So I think that we all agree that the introduction of this concept of the European Health Union was very necessary and very welcome. And CPME, of course, was also um, very pleased to have this vision uh, for our health systems coming out of the pandemic. Um, we see that a lot has been done to deal with the uh, post-pandemic preparedness, but then we look towards the health systems overall and uh, actually see still a lot of need uh, for action. And especially when it comes to the health workforce, we have to say that really we have not left the crisis mode yet. 
um, in order to be able to provide uh, sustainable patient care, we think it really needs at you and as national level, uh, we've already heard investment, but also policy action to ensure that uh, health systems and health services can continue because we actually see uh, deterioration. You mentioned the health at a glance. I'll be very interested in seeing that because from our membership, we hear increasing levels of burnout. We hear really an extreme burden when it comes to dealing with uh, not only working on the backlog, uh, which built up during the pandemic, but also now facing the new uh, health problems uh, that are occurring. Uh, from, from the socioeconomic context we are living in. And plus, looking to the future, we really see a recruitment and retention crisis. So um, we really uh, would like to share this hopeful future. And we do see that a lot has been done, but uh, we cannot rest here. Um, and maybe just to give one example of, of what we saw, we, we've already said that we still see continued health inequalities in, in the healthcare system, and uh, we see continued problems with accessing healthcare. And actually, one of the very concrete measures that we would have liked to have seen uh, now uh, moving a little bit um, into a more reflective phase of how to solve this is for the Commission to give very concrete recommendations to health systems our national governments on a minimum capacities that need to be built up to, on the one hand, to be able to ensure universal health coverage, but also to ensure future emergency response. And uh, this is really an idea which arrived from our uh, members' reflection on the pandemic, where we saw that health systems basically moved to adjust in time kind of functioning so that uh, resources were, were moved to a level uh, which were very economically driven, but not so maybe patient care driven and created working environments for health professionals, which are no longer sustainable. So our pledge is to really move to a just in case uh, way of thinking about health systems to build future capacities for emergencies, but also especially stabilize healthcare systems and the healthcare workforce in normal time. Sarada, thank you so much. And thank you for reminding us that a lot needs to be done in countries protecting health workers, actually. The physical protection against, you know, virus, harm, violence as well. But also there is the mental protection. People were, as you say, we had a lot of burnout and people were exposed to situations during COVID-19, which were unseen before. But there's also in many countries social protection that in case of um, ill health, they are not sufficiently protected health workers. And I'm very happy and very interested to hear that you see further roles actually of Europe, you know, when it comes to capacity planning or capacity indicators and uh, discussing it, what should be minimum levels across the, the European Union. Thank you so much. And now it's my uh, great pleasure to um, introduce my colleague, uh, Nicole Mauer. And everything what I've learned about EU uh, tools, I, I've learned from her, actually, because uh, she's been trawling through an unbelievable amount of documents, websites, trying to systematize it and bringing them together and seeing, you know, what sort of tool is good for what sort of purpose. Please, uh, Nicole, your, your reflections on the first round of discussions. Thank you, Matthias, for that introduction. And also thank you to Gastein and the observatory for, for having me today. Um, I think we've already had a wide range of contributions, uh, both around the usefulness of these tools, but also obviously on what still needs to be done and how maybe these instruments can, can help us with achieving that. So um, I think I'm gonna use my two minutes to uh, just reflect on the instruments again and just um, maybe summarize what we've had and echo some of the things that were said. Uh, firstly, I think we've we've seen that the the scope and the financial um, aspect of these instruments has enormously changed and evolved uh, as a result of the pandemic. And the Austrian example is is the best one to show us that they can have added value at national level and they can be combined effectively with national resources uh, when needed. Um, however, I also want to acknowledge the challenges that were mentioned. Um, Obviously, for health policymakers at national level, it's it's not always easy to know what is available, um, in which policy area to look, because many of these instruments, as we heard, are not geared towards health systems specifically. Uh, this lies 
also this is also the result of, of the EU having a complementary competence in the area of health and that many of the actions that that are performed are are a little bit fragmented and, and might be anchored in different policy areas. So another point that I, I wanted to make is that European um, tools cannot really support health systems with the running costs of health systems. Um, and that might make it even more challenging for, for policymakers to make a case and say, look, we need to access this money because um, they might work in ways that are not um, directly intuitive. So. They require uh, some, some level of, of creativity and, and it, they require people to know where to look and they require policymakers to, to know how to use them, how to access them. And I think the positive takeaway from today's discussion is that there are mechanisms um, starting to, to being put into place that can help us with using these instruments. So as Maya mentioned, for example, the, the HSVA expert group as a forum to talk about health systems or the TSI as, as a technical support instrument where member states can go with their reform ideas or, or issues or country specific recommendations they've received in the European semester and say, we would like to do this, how can we do it? And, um, and finally, the, the Austrian upcoming project with Slovenia and Belgium where this type of support will be tailored specifically towards health. So it won't only be the TSI, but a, a hub where we can really come with, for example, we have an issue with, with our workforce. How can, we, how can we train them more effectively? How can we support the mental health of the, of the workforce? And, and then the, the resources hub can provide tailored support for that. So I think that's a very good first step in the right direction. And yeah. Thank, I'll, I'll thank you so that. much. Nicole, and I take it from you, it really does have to do something with mindset in member states, but also with absorptive capacity, you know, being able, you know, to make, make some, some, some sense and some use out of it. Before we go into the second round of uh, panel discussion, I would like to bring you on board, uh, Dolly, again. And uh, I know that you have monitored the chat box, um, Dolly. What, what has come through? Can we feedback something to the panelists? Yeah, uh, thank you, Matthias, and and a big thanks to to all the speakers. Uh, it's been it's been interesting monitoring the the chat uh, because I think it showcases very clearly what the big issues of our times are. And one of the major issues was the situation of healthcare and healthcare professionals. So um, how do we ensure the sustainability uh, and the resilience of, of the healthcare sector. And that was specifically asked uh, regarding palliative care and its supply chains, but also uh, about a vision of a future role of healthcare procurement was, was in the chat and how we can make sure that the role of future health prof professionals remains future-proof and sustainable. So that, that was on the one hand, on, on, uh, more or less on, on this topic. And there was also an interesting question on the global perspective. So uh, are there any plans of uh, scaling up the European Health Union to, to a global model or learning from other parts of the world, like uh, Latin American Health Information System or uh, uh, India Citizens ID? So um, that was the other side of it. And we received a couple of questions beforehand, and they were very much focused on, um, on health systems. And one of them was uh, centered around are member states equally uh, equipped to pick up funds or do we need to focus more on the governance of member states? And, and in this connection also uh, the topic of corrupt, corruption was mentioned. How do we ensure that uh, funds do not go to, to any corrupt bodies? And um, one more topic was uh, whether prevention should not be taken into account also when granting these funds. So more or less. Thank you so much, nutshell, Dolly. That's I think, what I've seen I think so these far. are these are really key topics, and I mean the health workforce. We are talking all year about the health workforce, about the aging of the health workforce, 
about the problems of retention and also the medical deserts where you have difficulties of access, of course, you know. And um, then the, the question on are we equipped to deal with all these new tools and with the monies or the corruption issue, it's really what I think Ricardo actually said. Um, we have to be careful not to use the money for the same old stuff, but really doing something innovative. And the last one was the prevention. So please, each of the panelists, pick out the question you feel best suited to respond to. Maybe, I mean, there's a lot of different questions, but maybe um, this kind of governance element is a little bit common to all of them. And there, I would say that we really need to see action uh, at grassroots and at the very top level. I think uh, on the one hand, uh, we've said a lot of money is being spent. We just recently had a conference with our membership on um, on, for example, recovery resilience facility and saw that the level of engagement of stakeholders differs greatly. So some of these decisions about actually where to make these investments is made at a political level rather than at one where people, patients, professionals from the healthcare systems are able to provide input. And uh, this is somewhere where we really see an opportunity for improvement. The other end of governments, I would like to go to the very top level. And this was already mentioned um, by MEP Leite that he was saying actually ministries of health sometimes lack the leverage and actually all of these things I've been saying are not contested in the health system everybody knows all of these issues and actually the data also shows into a very clear uh, direction but there is perhaps a lack of really top political buy-in to make a change here and that's why we believe that health needs to stay on the very highest political agendas even if the immediate urgency of the pandemic has maybe now been overshadowed by other urgent urgencies which which um, are uh, affecting our societies but um, we've seen that stable health systems are the motor of functioning socioeconomic systems so we hope that this uh, top level political interest will not wane and uh, there will be continued support to make these important policy decisions. Sarada, thank you so much. If I understand you correctly, you emphasize that um, the governance will be a key lever, you know, to make all of this a success, actually. And without good governance, it, it won't work. And we are not quite say there, if I understand you. So we need to uh, keep the activity level high for a while that we can reform and improve our governance and also that as you say, the buy-in from some top-level policy ma makers is really fully assured. Um, Ricardo, may I ask you um, as the next one, you know, uh, we had the questions, the health workforce, the governance and the prevention, and there was also, I think, an issue of learning from other um, regions. Well, um, I, I, the, the health workers challenge, I think, is the greatest of all, to be honest, because beyond everything that uh, both Sarada and Nicole have already brought to the table, which are already challenges of their own, there is then the global market that is currently working. And, uh, you know, and I think it was 2017 or 18 that Portugal exported as many nurses as the ones that were actually trained in our own country. And we are way below OECD average when it comes to the ratio of nurses that we need in our health system. That's just one very concrete example of how even a country that is investing through its public health uh, education system towards training, then we are failing to retain, uh, which I think should raise a lot of questions from uh, whoever is running the Ministry of Health, so to say. Why are we unable to motivate these people to stay? And, and we need to address this issue from a bottom-up perspective also. It's not going to go just with incentives coming from the top. We need to have very thorough understanding of what motivates health workers to want to work in health systems. And actually, I think in creating these kind of, uh, of tools that can help us, as Sarada mentioned, create the minimum needs uh, requirements for health systems can actually be a very important tool to make sure that governments address this more seriously. Another topic I'd like to mention based on what we heard is uh, uh, around uh, the European role when it comes to pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. I think we there is right now a very serious negotiation happening led by WHO. The zero draft of the pandemic treaty has already been shared. And uh, I believe that the European Union not only can, must, but must play a leading role 
in the negotiation process, making sure that accountability mechanisms, that financial incentives are put in place because we saw with COVID-19 that the international health regulations and even European rules were insufficient to deal with such challenging cross-border health threats. And so this is a unique opportunity as we are still in the pandemic, but phasing out to actually not lose momentum to provoke the changes. And I think that if, if Europe doesn't lead the way, no one will, to be honest, in the global scale. And that leads me to the last issue that I think is extremely important, which is many times in the policy space, we are reinventing the wheel. We are dealing with a problem and we try to find in the literature uh, some kind of uh, legal uh, policy solution that's out there. Many times, it, it, the fact is most literature is Anglo-centric, and they're very interesting uh, policy examples being developed in parts of the world that nobody knows about if, because uh, we do not have that kind of, of networking being done by policymakers. And so that's actually something that my organization tries to promote a bit, you know, through the Unite Parliamentarians Network for Global Health, bringing parliamentarians from around the world together. But this is something that I think the European Health Union, establishing partnerships with other uh, regions around the world, we can try to make the most of that kind of collective intelligence and then use that to fuel um, health system reform using the European Health Union as creating standards of good practices and then helping countries in the adaptation of those good yeah. practices to their own context. Thank you so much, uh, Ricardo. And I understand in the work, health workforce, we also need to do our homework actually with recruitment, retention, avoiding medical deserts. The pandemic treaty, you heard, uh, you know, yesterday the um, global, EU global health strategy was uh, was launched and there's a lot of um, stuff in it for, for us and not reinventing the wheel. It's something we are saying all the time, you know, let's let's share what we actually know. Nicole, very briefly, sorry for the, for the rush. That's okay. I'll try to uh, address more than one thing in, in one minute. Um, I just wanted to pick up what both of the speakers were saying about um, the window of opportunity and not losing momentum and, and how we can achieve that. Um, and I think the key really lies in, in making, making a case for and, and calling attention to these interdependencies that we have across different policy areas. So um, just making it clear to, to the decision makers that investing in health is, is ultimately what makes societies uh, more resilient and, and economies prosperous. And um, in that sense, the recovery and resilience facility is one of the instruments that we can use, for example, for prevention. Um, some countries have, have uh, dedicated money to strengthen primary health care, community health care, and there is a, a real framework to um, assess the implementation uh, of, of how these how this money will be will be used and how it will be um, implemented at national level and I think that by making evident how much um, I would say how, by showing that these indicators work and that and that the money that we use actually strengthens the resilience. So we need to mo be able to monitor that in a better way. By doing this, we can also make the case for investing in health systems. And this requires showing that, okay, the money might not be there for health initially, it might be born in another policy area, but when we use it for health, we actually have good outcomes and that not only strengthens uh, the healthcare system, but by preventing diseases, we can also strengthen the society in other ways, or by, for example, funding infrastructure, we can um, improve the, the the environmental sustainability of of, um, of the entire system. And in that way, Nicole, sorry, thank, thank, thank you so much. But <laughs> there's a clear, up. <laughs> a clear, a clear plea for more transparency, better data, and better analysis, actually. Um, Maya, can I ask you to come on board? First of all, thank you so much to uh, our wonderful panelists. And I would like to uh, wrap up this together with you, Maya. My only sentence here is actually what I learned from today is that making the European Health Union a success depends on both sides. Not only the commission, its programs and budget, but it depends on a real partnership. And the partnership lies a little bit in the governance, a little bit in the absorptive capacity and using the money in innovative new ways and not pouring it into um, models of the past. But please, Maya. 
<laughs> okay. Um, I want to just wrap up with, uh, I think, two points that I've heard from the chat. Um, it's been really fascinating. It's always really good to hear different perspectives. I want to bring another issue to the table, uh, which is not a new issue, but I think needs to be discussed when we're talking about health systems, resilience and sustainability. And that's the whole discussion about One Health. Um, I think it's absolutely key because uh, we always talk about uh, antimicrobial resistance as the silent um, pandemic. It's already here with us now. So we also need to find a way to integrate on top of the complexity. We need to find a way of how to integrate all of the One Health challenges that we see before us. And then the other issue is, again, the workforce. For those of you who know me uh, by now, you know, for me, this is an area I'm really passionate about. And I liked what Ricardo said. I think that above all, we have to be humble and we have to understand the motivations behind people taking jobs in the health sector. And uh, we need to find a way to try to transform this. So to finish, I would say for the workforce, for the health system, we need to transform and not tinker. That's great, Maya. And now, Dolly, you can say the final goodbye for our joint webinar. And uh, we hope to see you again. Huh? Dolly, please. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I think we could have gone on for a while also looking at the questions. Thanks very much for them. We will go through them and we'll gladly come back to you directly if we get some answers from our speakers, which I'm sure we will. So uh, big thanks to everyone for joining us, especially to our speakers, but also to all the participants who joined us today. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Mm -hmm.